Um, good afternoon. I'm Eric Beinhacker, uh, Director of INET Octor. It's my great pleasure to um, uh, welcome uh, Simon as our speaker today. He's going to be talking about his uh, brand new book, uh, Five Times Faster. Um, uh, Simon has been a, a terrific friend and, and colleague of the INET Oxford Center and of the Smith School. Um, you know, we've uh, been collaborating both formally on a variety of projects over the years and also informally uh, exchanging uh, ideas and strategies. And I know personally, I've always just hugely valued um, uh, Simon and his, his thinking on these, these complex issues and his deep experience. Uh, Simon's, you know, been kind of behind the scenes at the heart of a lot of action uh, on uh, climate energy and the economy here in the UK. Um, he's currently director of economics for the Climate Champions team and a senior fellow at the World Resources Institute. Um, but before that, he was um, core in the planning for the uh, uh, COP26 uh, in Glasgow uh, when he was working in the cabinet office. Uh, and he's worked um, uh, for the Minister of Energy and Climate Change in the UK government. He was at the, at the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy for a number of years um, and uh, has also had, I didn't know this, diplomatic postings in China and India uh, back earlier in his career. And uh, after Simon uh, uh, gives us a presentation on his uh, book, uh, we have a very distinguished uh, panel with uh, Nicola Ranger, who leads the Resilience and International Development Program at the Environmental Change Institute, um, is also executive director of the Oxford Martin Program on Systemic Resilience, and most importantly, a senior fellow uh, here at uh, INET Oxford. Uh, and then Cameron Hepburn, uh, who for a couple more months is head of the uh, Smith School uh, before he goes back to um, uh, doing the very uh, distinguished and leading edge research that he's been doing uh, for most of his career, including leading the uh, program on sustainability uh, here at, uh, at INET. Um, and uh, just before I turn it over to Simon uh, to set the stage, um, I think it's gonna be a, a fairly provocative talk uh, because when I got my copy of the book and I cracked it open and looked at the table of contents, I saw there's part one science, good. Part two economics, okay. First chapter in economics titled Worse Than Useless. <laughs> so I think that sets, sets the tone and uh, turn it over to you. Sorry. Thanks very much, Eric. Um, it's really nice to be here. INET um, has been a massive inspiration as an institution and as, as individuals, several people. I was realizing earlier, there's quite a lot of people that you'll see mentioned in these slides, uh, but this is the first time I've seen them all in the same place. <laughs> That's a pleasure. So a huge thanks to INET for existing um, and for inspiring a lot of us in government and, of course, much more widely. So um, this book, starting point, is lots of different ways you can measure this. But any way you, need, any way you do, we have to decarbonize the world economy a hell of a lot faster. And if you measure it this way in terms of uh, GHG emissions per unit global GDP over the last two decades, they came down about one and a half percent a year. This decade, they'd have to come down 8% a year to meet the one and a half uh, degree temperature limit. And so occasionally my book is misreported as saying that I'm arguing that we must act five times faster. I'm not arguing that at all. That's just what a simple piece of maths shows. Uh, what I'm doing is arguing about how the hell we do that. This is bloody difficult. So how are we gonna go five times faster? And my way of, of thinking about this is if you want to change the visible infrastructure of the economy, the coal plants, the factories, the buses and trucks, you have to change the invisible infrastructure. And it's not just the invisible infrastructure of the pipelines and the electricity wires and all that stuff. It's also the invisible infrastructure of ideas and institutions. You can't see them, but they determine how a lot of things work. And um, as Eric said, this, this book's got three parts, the, the science, the economics, and the diplomacy. And I think in each of those areas, there are fundamental structural problems, things that need changing for us to have a chance of going as fast as we need to go. Since we're at INET today, I'm going to almost only talk about the economics, but I'll briefly mention the other two. So first, science. The big structural problem in science is that we're being given prediction when we need risk assessment. And to describe the difference between the two, imagine your humanity, you're the frog in the slowly boiling pot of water, and you say to your science advisor, it feels like it's getting a bit warmer in here, uh, what's going on? 
And your science advisor comes back to you and says, yes, you're right. Um, in five minutes time, I reckon it's going to be two degrees warmer, plus or minus one degree. And you go, oh, that's nice. Uh, could I have a risk assessment, please? And your science advisor goes, uh, what, what's that? And you say, well, what's the worst that could happen? And he goes, oh, it's easy. Uh, you're boiled to death. And you go, okay, how likely is that then? And he goes, well, in five minutes, not at all. In 10 minutes, 50-50. In 20 minutes, 100%. You go, oh, okay. I know what to do then. That's the difference. And the vast majority of the research that's being done and communicated and packaged up and given to governments is of this kind, prediction kind, not the risk assessment. And so that means we know much less than we need to know about thresholds of nonlinear impact. Things like when heat and humidity cross the human body's limit of tolerance, so that if you, even if you're young and healthy and lag down in the shade, you die. Uh, things like crops limits of tolerance for high temperatures, where they also fall over and die. Cities limits of tolerance for sea level rise at the point where it's just not worth defending them anymore. There are lots of those thresholds, and we don't know as much about them as we should. And of course, there are also these thresholds in the climate system itself, where it doesn't have any particular interests, so it's, it's not quite the same, but of course, it can also change in these nonlinear ways. And when you look at how expert judgment has changed over time, it's changed quite remarkably towards assessing higher risk at lower degrees of change. It seems that we've been underestimating the instability in the climate system. And of course, each of these tipping points that you pass in the system increases the chances of tipping others. So this system as a whole, we have to think about as surprisingly unstable. And it seems the science has been underestimating that. Now, that's my link to economics, really, because if in science there's a problem of underappreciation of the instability of the system, in economics it's a lot worse than that, because we've just assumed that the system is completely stable. So I, I draw this contrast between <laughs> the idea of equilibrium, which is at the heart of nearly all of the economics that informs government policy. <laughs> it's defined this my, my Oxford Dictionary of Economics, so it must be right. <laughs> and the definition is a situation in which nobody has any immediate reason to change their actions so that the status quo can continue, at least temporarily. Contrast that with what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says that we have to do to fix this problem, rapid and far-reaching system transitions unprecedented in terms of scale in each of the emitting sectors of the global economy, power, transport, industry, land use, buildings. That's about as far away from equilibrium as you could possibly get. It means a situation where Everybody has lots of reason to change their actions so that the status quo gets turned completely upside down really quickly on an unprecedented scale. So we've got the wrong starting point here, and that matters very significantly. It makes a difference, first of all, to how we even imagine the economy. What do we think it's like? If you think it's an equilibrium system, you're actually thinking of it like a machine. It might have some moving parts, but the relationships between those parts never changes. It's predictable. If you know it's starting conditions, you can predict everything that's going to happen afterwards. And it either functions or fails. So the role of policy is to fix it when it fails. If you think about it in disequilibrium, you find you're actually thinking of it, well, as everybody in, in this place has says, as a complex adaptive system. In other words, it's like an ecosystem. In fact, it is an ecosystem because it's just a bunch of animals walking around with some tools and exchanging things. So of course it works like an ecosystem. Of course it works according to the rules of evolution. So it's constantly changing. It's uncertain. You can predict some, some things, but other things are unknown. And it's got effectively unlimited possibilities. There's no meaning of functioning or failing. So the role of the policy can't be to fix it when it fails. There's no such thing as failing. All you can do is guide its evolution in different directions. So what does that mean in practice? Well, I'm going to describe it in relation to the three main levers of policy, um, giving money, taking money away, and regulating things. And so first, investment. And, and you might notice there's, there's three names down here, Bonehocker, Hepburn, and Farmer. Um, 
Not, not sure who those dodgies <laughs> they, they might be somewhere nearby. I've, I've actually used this so many times, this graph. Of course, the standard advice is the most efficient way to decarbonize is put a price on carbon. And yet, as Stefan Halligat, senior economist for climate change at the World Bank, noticed, all of the change that we've made has been brought about by targeted investment, not by a price on carbon. And that progress has not been just small. When we've done the right thing, that progress has been spectacular. A global deployment of solar PV in 2020, we all thought it was going to be about 50 gigawatts. We ended up with 714 gigawatts, more than 14 times as much as we predicted. Um, so did we just get amazingly lucky? We did the second best thing, and then it turned out 10 times better than we expected. Or was that actually not an accident? I think it was not an accident. I think um, well, it's not just what I think. The new technologies, when they're undergoing a process of development, they benefit from all of these reinforcing feedbacks, the learning by doing, the economies of scale, the emergence of complementary technologies. The more you make it, the better it gets, the cheaper it gets, the more people buy it, the more people invest in it, the better it gets, and so on. These increasing returns to scale. When you invest in the new technology, you directly strengthen that reinforcing feedback. So you get amazing bang for your buck. If you just tax the old system, you might have that effect, but there's no guarantee that you will. You might just nudge the incumbent system to operate slightly more efficiently than it was doing before and carry on. So actually putting a price on carbon, I think is generally speaking, quite likely to be an inefficient thing to do dynamically. Investing in, in the new thing is the right thing to do. And this is even clearer when you look back at past examples of fast transitions. Um, and one of the few economists I'm citing in this talk who's not from Oxford, I know, is Frank Heels, who's one of the top uh, sort of historians of socio-technical transitions of the past. And you look at any of those descriptions, all of them happened by investing in the new thing, whether it was, you know, civil aviation, where first we all competitively invested during the First World War in research and development. And then soon after that, the US airmail system subsidized airlines 50% of their income throughout the 1930s. Or the transition to intensive agriculture in the UK, where we gave capital grants for tractors and trained all the farmers. Or of course, as I've shown here, the transition to horses and cars, where people invested in the motors, the cars, they built the motorways, they wrote the highway code. They didn't do all of that just by putting a tax on a horse ship. And when you think about these past transitions, that's really obvious. So that was investment. The, the second thing is regulation. And um, I always like showing this graph because I just love the way it came about. The, the guy who instigated this study is this guy, S. Chu, Stephen Chu a Nobel Prize winning physicist who then became energy secretary to President Obama. And when he was doing that job, he wanted to have high energy efficiency and standards for things like fridges and air conditioners, washing machines. And he knew that would be a political battle. He knew he'd have to fight for it. He thought at least his own energy department would be on his side. But every time the economists did their impact assessments, they just said, oh, this is gonna increase the prices of these appliances. Yeah, you'll save on the operating costs, but it'll push the prices up because it's your distorting regulation, messing with the nice equilibrium of the economy. And he just thought, well, that doesn't sound true. I just don't think that's right. And he went back and did this study. Uh, God knows how he found the time. But he found that actually at the point where you put in place these tough standards, the price decrease accelerates. So it's where the little circles are. That's where the standard came in and the gradient changes. The opposite of what the standard economics had expected. What is the red versus the blue? Um, I think one of them. One of them is price. Yeah, one of them is price, and the other one is life cycle cost. Okay. Um, so again, that could be just by accident. But if we're thinking about the economy in uh, evolutionary terms, then it no longer seems surprising. Um, this is, this is actually from quite an old paper. What determines the rate of evolution in 1976? Uh, but apparently this is still roughly right. That the rate of evolution is inversely proportional to the mean fitness of the current population. 
So what you do when you have a regulation that suddenly sets a new efficiency <laughs> standard or that suddenly requires all vehicles to be zero emission is you massively radically change the fitness function of that part of the economy. So whatever it was that you were doing before will no longer be successful. To be successful, you now have to do something different. And if you don't know how to do that thing, good. That means you have to innovate quite fast. You can't just spend all your money on advertising. Um, we, we're seeing this now in the car industry, of course. The, the places that have instigated tough standards like China and California, and to some extent the EU, uh, they're managing to make the car industry behave less like a cow and more like a wildebeest. It's under more pressure. It has to evolve more quickly. Another way I, I think of regulation is it, it changes the flow of finance. You imagine that the flow of finance through a sector of the economy is, is like a river. Most of the time, it, it can just wander on quite slowly, not really doing any work uh, from you, the consumer, through the producer to the ultimate shareholders of the company. What you can do with regulation is you just switch the flow with a chunk of that. And you say, you know what? You can only flow through this sector through a more narrow channel where you have to do some work along the way. So that was regulation. The, the, the third one, tax. Um, here, the, the standard economic advice is that you, if you're going to have a carbon price, you should set it at a level that reflects the social cost of carbon. And this bit on the left is, is a nice piece of advice from the White House Council of Economic Advisors in the autumn of 2013, where they said they'd uh, done some rigorous evaluation of costs and benefits and uh, used the most widely cited climate economic impact models. Of course, there they were confusing widely cited with good. Um, <laughs> and the result of that was that they updated their estimate of the social cost of carbon from $36 per tonne to $37 per tonne of CO2. At exactly the same time, this was a, a draft chapter in the IPCC's fifth assessment report where they said, you know, there's, there's further source of uncertainty, which is basically whether you care about the future of the human race. Uh, but if you do, then to have a social cost of carbon, you have to invent a parameter representing essentially willingness to pay to avoid human extinction. <laughs> Without such a parameter, social cost of carbon estimates can be unboundedly high. In other words, they're somewhere between naught and infinity. So never mind the philosophical aspects of that. If you're just a policymaker trying to figure out where to set your carbon price, it leaves you feeling a little bit unsure. What's a different way of thinking about that? Well, a different way is to say that in the ecosystem economy, there's no such thing as absolute value. So don't waste your time thinking about absolute value. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is relative value. In any given sector of the economy, what's competing with what else? And what are their relative values? How do you help one win against the other? And in the course of a transition, you can think about it as having sort of two halves. There's a first half where the balancing feedbacks are dominant, the incumbent system lock it. You push it, you try and change something and it pushes back. The harder you push to change, the harder it pushes back. There's a second half of the transition where it gains its own momentum. It's already past the tipping point. Everything you do, it just speeds up. In the middle, of course, is the tipping point. And here you can think of the role of a carbon tax as quite different. It's just tipping the scales in favor of the clean technology when it's competing with the fossils. And I did this paper with Tim Lenton a few years ago. Tim Lenton is an expert in tipping points in the climate system. And we got together and in fact, Cameron, you, you gave me this idea back in 2015, saying that maybe people should think about carbon prices, can it tip the balance in competition um, instead of just meeting an arbitrary value. And we found there was evidence of tipping points in both the world's fastest power sector decarbonization and the world's fastest transition to zero emission vehicles and road transport. In the UK, it was where we were growing renewables quickly, the space for coal and gas was shrinking in the power sector, and this fixed carbon tax just happened to be just enough to tip the balance between coal and gas. So if you, in the power sector, you have this thing, an emergent phenomenon called the merit order, where the cheapest thing gets to generate first, and so on. And when you change around coal and gas, it meant gas got to generate first and coal had to wait instead of the other way around. That actually crossed a second tipping point, which was coal went from being profitable to unprofitable. And at that point, 
utility companies started blowing up coal power stations, which was really pleasingly uh, you know, spectacular on the front page of the Daily Mail and so on. And the UK's coal as a share of power generation dropped off a cliff. And over the last decade or so, the UK's power sector decarbonisation was about eight times faster than the global average. Norway did a, a very simple thing, which is use a combination of tax and subsidy to make electric vehicles cheaper at the point of purchase than petrol cars. It's not the only policy they have. There are plenty of other good EV policies too, but their own EV agency says that's the one they think made the critical difference. And of course, why would that be a surprise? Make it cheaper, a lot more people want to buy it. And look at that. At the point where we did this paper, Norway's electric vehicle share of car sales was 20 times the global average. Why isn't there more like that? Why aren't there more of those examples? Why are these the exception? I think it has at least one factor must be that the advice is telling us all to look in the wrong place. Waste time to think about absolute values when we should be thinking about relative values. Connected to this is the idea that the carbon price should be equal across the whole economy. But of course, if you're thinking of it in terms of activating tipping points, you want anything but an equal price across the economy. You want the right level in each sector. And if it happens to be just right for cars, it will be far less than you need for steel and far more than you need in buildings and power. Uh, final point on economics um, is, is a more strategic one. Uh, actually, you never use these tools of policy in isolation. You use them all together and you use them generally to try and get some kind of outcome. Try and go somewhere. You're trying to guide the evolution of the economy. But one, one, one sort of idea that often presents us, prevents us from thinking about this in a sensible way is the idea that policy should be technology neutral. And if you have a machine economy, why not? You take out one part, you put in another part, it's made of a different material, it functions just the same, the machine doesn't change. But if your economy is an ecosystem, of course you can't be technology neutral any more than you could mess in this aquatic ecosystem in a way that was completely neutral with respect to all of its inhabitants. Anything you do is going to advantage yeah. them and disadvantage others. The question is, are you aware of that? Do you know which ones you're helping or which ones you're disadvantaged? And have you thought about the implications of it consciously and not unconsciously? And this, this was something that was recognized actually by uh, David Mackay, who was the Chief Science Advisor at the Department of Energy and Climate Change. Uh, I won't recount the gory details of the one in which the UK's 2012 electricity market reform was designed to be technology neutral to satisfy the European Commission regulations, but let's just say it was extremely convoluted. And David Mackay did a good job pointing out how it was all made up and it involved consultants making some guesses government paying them so that we could say that we had some evidence um, and all of that being effectively arbitrary. What happens when you make these arbitrary choices is you choose things by accident. And there was a point where I was working for the energy minister and we realized that by accident, because of this supposedly technology neutral design, we we're about to give billions of pounds to subsidizing biomass, which means chopping down forests in North America <laughs> sticking the wood in big dirty ships, shipping it across the Atlantic, putting it in trucks to drive it to Drax power station and burning lots of little bits of wood. And even the economists who are pretty firm believers in technology neutrality, at some point, I think, conceded that burning wood might not be the job creating, cost reducing, you know, innovation enhancing technology of the 21st century. So you have to choose, and of course these choices matter because it's not just about what we do next, it's about how the whole economy evolves. If you think about the old competition over a hundred years ago between electric cars, petrol cars, and steam cars, the outcome of that had quite a big impact on the shape of the economy that we now have, and in fact, the shape of the climate that we now have. So you really have to think about those choices seriously. Now, a final quick word on diplomacy. Um, and here there's a strong link to the economics. The economics has, has actually shaped the way that people think about the diplomacy. Uh, this, this is a fairly typical 
example of, of the way that people have thought about the economics of emissions reduction for a long time, which is that the more you want to reduce your emissions, the more it's going to cost. And it's, it's like a never ending upward hill. And in fact, in, in some of the models by nice people like Bill Nordhaus, it's even worse than that because you reduce emissions one year. If you want that same emissions reduction the next year, you have to do it all over again. There's no permanent change. So it actually is just like Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the hill in Hades and getting back to where he started every year. Luckily, the real world isn't like that. And the technology transition, it might be like a hill, but it's a hill that has a summit and a downward slope on the other side, not like a hill in Hades. And of course, as, as <coughs> Oxford Aina knows very well, it's pointed out to the world, uh, the clean economy is actually better than the dirty old fossil economy where we started, even if we don't care about climate change, we save loads of money. So this creates a different context for diplomacy. It means instead of imagining a world of static technology and static interests where the game of diplomacy is to divide up the finite eye of the global carbon budget, which is necessarily a negative sum game, Instead of that, the game is work together to accelerate up the S curve of the technology transition in each emitting sector. And that can be a positive sum game. And as soon as you think in these terms, you start realizing there are all these different kinds of coordination games, larger economies of scale, stronger incentives for investment, level playing fields where you need them, faster innovation, all of these things that countries can achieve by acting together that they can't achieve when they act alone. So um, I, I'm sort of skipping over several stages of the argument. So you'll just we can come back to this in discussion if people want to. But what what that sort of negative sum static world paradigm has led us to in diplomacy is actually focusing on a point of least leverage. When you're trying to divide up the global carbon pie, you have to look economy wide. You have to have all the countries in the world around the table, and you have to look at long term targets. But actually, everybody around the table is the lowest of the low common denominators, long term targets, you have zero confidence in compared to the actions you can take now. And in common and me wide scope is just too large a scope for diplomacy to be useful. Diplomacy has only ever worked when it took on problems of manageable chunks. And it turns out to be effective, we need to be at the opposite end of all three of those axes. So we have to shift towards a point of maximum leverage. Um, what gives me hope is that uh, COP26, a bunch of countries, 45 of them representing 70% of the global economy, they actually did agree that they would work together in this new paradigm of climate diplomacy, where they'd work to try and make the clean technologies the most affordable, accessible, and attractive option in each emitting sector. In other words, make the clean stuff better than the fossil stuff across the tipping point. And of course, just like in the climate, so also in the global economy, every time we cross one tipping point, it increases our chances of crossing others. But this time, the tipping points are our friend, and the inherent instability in the global economy is also our friend. So given that, we might just about have a chance of moving five times faster. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Simon. Um, if I could ask our panelists to Hold on up. Uh, up. And uh, we'll have uh, a few thoughts in response, and then uh, we'll open it up for, for discussion. Maybe. Um... Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. Um, sure. <laughs> Just uh, for the folks on Zoom, we're going to stop sharing screens so we can. So there you go. Yeah, there you go. Then they can see our very nice panelists. Excellent. Great. Um, shall we start with you? Yes. Well, well firstly, well, thank you for the in the introduction and the invitation to be here, Eric. So to be here, and wow, what an amazing book! I I must admit, I really enjoyed reading this book. But for me, it was like twenty years of catharsis. <laughs> 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 every page I read I thought yes finally someone has said this 
Um, so, so I, I definitely recommend the book. I think, um, yeah, just just to to make a a, a few points. So, so th there's a there's a part of the book where where you talk about the economics and you ask the question, does this matter? And you talk about um, Nordhaus. I love I love your description of the issues with Nordhaus. So, for the, for those that don't follow this literature, and most of you do, uh, Nordhaus is is one of one of the the economists in this area that produce pretty low numbers for the, the impacts of climate change, shall we say, on GDP. And you make a great comment, which I'll read out, which is, he's taking an arbitrary number and an unreliable number and combining them in an inappropriate way. <laughs> <laughs> does this matter? Actually, it does. I, I want to talk how important it is and how, um, how much it has set back the agenda that we haven't got this right so far. It's it's incredibly important. Those numbers have been incredibly sticky, and you know we've taken you know decades, and I still don't think we've solved the problem of um, estimating risk properly, uh, both both on the science side and and the economic side. And I and I think that and you know a lot of your talk has focused on the solutions, and I think that's important. But I I do think tackling this problem of how we estimate risk is absolutely essential. And, and one of the reasons for that is that I now see the same mistakes being made in many other areas. So, you know, working um, with uh, central banks and ministries of finance at the moment, they are taking the same evidence and making the same mistakes. Uh, so if, if to take one example, um, you look at uh, the Bank of England, and I, I love what the Bank of England does on climate, you know, they're world leading on this, but if you look at how they're assessing risk to the UK, um, they take a beautifully smooth transition path. It's delayed, but it's still beautifully smooth, estimate transition risk based on that, and then they estimate risks, uh, physical risks based on uh, average annual changes in uh, flood and windstorm, and that's it. And surprisingly, the numbers come out really, really small at the end. And, and when we've spoken to financial institutions, they say uh, they do not believe the numbers. And, and we did a survey loss that was published in March on this that showed that 60% of them are saying that the numbers are far, far too small. And this is really important because this guides the flow of funding because these numbers feed into capital allocations, risk assessments, pricings of financial products. So that's just one example, I think. So I do think that we need to really urgently tackle um, this area. Co coming on to the solution. So one, one, if I'm if I may level a criticism, um, one one is that I, I and, and this comes from my work in developing countries. I feel that in in the global north we think about climate change in isolation. In when you talk to countries in the developing world they see climate change as one of a number of issues that they're dealing with. And I don't think we capture that well enough at all either. And certainly from my experience of, you know, working on COVID, for example, um, in looking at the Ukraine crisis, all of these shocks happen at the same time and they amplify each other. And, and that affects both the, the risks. So it means that I think actually our risks are far greater than if we just look at climate change in isolation, um, but also on the solutions. And, and my, to, to make my final comment, um, we've been doing some work uh, actually here at the Smith School and with myself in ECI on looking at a resilient transition. And one of the, one of the motivations for this is that, you know, we often, again, we, we think of this transition as a smooth thing, but what we see in practice is that every time something happens, that transition slows down significantly. And actually, so I worked in climate policy until Copenhagen. And one of the things that led to the failure of Copenhagen was the global financial crisis happened just before. So every time something happens, it derails the political argument and, and derails action. We've seen that again and again and again. Um, and I think if we do not start accounting for that in the way that we're designing policy, um, we will not get to five times faster because every couple of years we'll say, actually, no, we just need to pause while we deal with, deal with this crisis. And I think there are things that we can do in how we design policy. And I think regulation, because it's a very slow moving instrument, is actually a way of doing that. And you can see it in the markets, for example, in the Ukraine crisis, you can see that in some parts of the world, the transition has slowed significantly. In other parts of the world, like Europe, it's actually largely continued. And that's because of changes, differences in policy between countries on the climate side. So I do think um, that's an area we need to do more. So bringing together the resilience 
and the and the transition into one one united piece. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thank you, Simon. This is a great book. Um, when Simon revealed that he was about to publish a book, I just saw how does he do it? I mean, people tell me I'm productive, but this guy was productive enough, and then this book appeared. So, but he's obviously a huge asset to humanity to have. Simon working in this space. I, I want to make three sets of comments um, in three areas. So the first one is around the framing of the problem. The second area is around the economics of the problem. And lastly, a few points on the politics. Now, on the framing, um, Simon wholeheartedly and obviously correctly adopts the kind of complexity, complex systems, complex economics framings that we love at INA at Oxford. And for probably all of us in this room, it feels so obvious. It feels so intuitive. And it's worth, I mean, we need books like this because it isn't obvious or intuitive. To, I, I'm still bashing my head against the wall understanding why it isn't obvious and intuitive. Because when I first came across uh, complexity science 25 years odd years ago um, in mathematics in Australia, uh, it was so exciting. and obvious, obviously correct, right lens that I started teaching it the year afterwards. And then when I came to economics, and it didn't feel so quite so kind of like we had the right framing, and I discovered complexity economics, I thought, oh, yes, of course, right, there we go, that's it. Obviously, the economy is more like an ecosystem, it is indeed an ecosystem, than it is like some sort of deterministic machine. And yet, and yet, we've been seeking to have um, policies implemented, research funding designed around these ideas for a decade or more, and it isn't obvious to people. And I'm not answering the question, why is it not obvious? Because I'm a bit like the, you know, the uber nerd who can't see that he can't teach properly because actually it's just all very obvious to him and nobody else can get it. And, and maybe all of us in this room are like that, where the uber nerds for whom it's just so obvious we can't get what the plebs can't see. But I think it's really important that we collectively work out how we communicate to people why actually the right framing for this problem, climate, uh, many problems, but climate in particular, is as of a complex, adaptive, uncertain system transition that requires, I mean, Simon, I mean, you put it beautifully. Why do we talk about failure when actually failure doesn't mean anything in such a system? Failure is only judged reference to some notion of perfection. Machines do fail. They go wrong. You have to reboot them. But it's not a machine. So, yeah, I think we need to change the framing. And to work to do that, we need to work out why it isn't obvious. And you made the point that these ideas are invisible. They're highly visible to us because we're working with them all the time. But, but they are invisible to many of the politicians and the policymakers and and they're like almost biases that are unconscious, uh, unconscious framings that we need to sort out. So that's point one. Point two on the economics. Um, so I'm a little bit kinder than Simon is to carbon pricing, as we were discussing earlier. Um, I don't think it's the be all and end all. Uh, I do think it, it changes that fitness landscape potentially in a useful way. So you can see carbon pricing as a tool of a complexity economist, actually, rather than just as a, you know, sorting a failure uh, and making it perfect. I'm also a bit more of a fan, perhaps, than you are, Simon, of, um, speak of failures, <laughs> of, um, of competitive pressures and the sort of auction processes that, um, I mean, I know you're a big fan of CFDs and the auction processes that have driven down the cost, but um, take, for instance, the tech neutral capacity mechanism in the UK. Now, ministers wanted that because they'd been lobbied by big utility companies that they needed more gas-fired CCGTs. So we'll have a capacity market and we'll get the gas-fired CCGT. <laughs> For me, the glory of a competitive market is that it delivers the outcome that you ask it, ask it to. And the outcome they wanted was a secure energy supply. And CCGTs were the presumed answer. But what we got were not CCGTs, no CCGT one, because it turned out there was a vast array of backup generation across the economy and small generators that was available to be turned on should the system need it to make sure that the grid didn't go off. It ended up being way cheaper, unbelievably cheap, 
Now, it may have been undesirable for other factors. I'm not sure I want diesel gen sets backing up the economy. But um, there is merit sometimes to these um, a little bit more tech neutral mechanisms because they can deliver surprise. But you've got to then design the mechanism really careful because it's going to deliver what you ask it to deliver. Um, and the other point about it is, and I think probably we fundamentally do agree, um, you can't, you're always picking. So this idea that you can just not pick is dodgy. I guess what I'm saying is that if you design your mechanism nicely, you don't quite know what you might be picking, but it might be good and you might not have realized it. So that's something to keep in mind. The, the second and final point on the economics is that I think the increasing returns to scale of these clean energy technologies is the most important, most underappreciated feature of this transition. Obviously, I know Oxford's majored on it quite rightly. And that comes out very strongly in the book, just how important uh, <laughs> this is. And it's another point that I think we just need to really hammer home to people that this isn't this isn't a task of Sisyphus. It is a task of tipping the system so that those dynamics can take over. And then the last set of points is on the politics. And I think the reason I'm hopeful, notwithstanding the need to go five times faster, is that actually uh, these dynamics and this evolutionary process is nonlinear. So you wouldn't expect it just to be going the same speed. You will expect dramatic changes in speed. And actually, when you put your foot down on your bike or whatever, you can quickly be going five times faster than you were previously. And the reason I think we might nonetheless do it, notwithstanding all the negative, you know, the, the balancing or blocking feedbacks in the system, is that once the economics of the clean economy starts to look favorable, as it increasingly does in many parts of the world, much of the time, suddenly the politics becomes easier. Because if you're asking your citizens to stump up cash, to pay costs, to burden share, you know, they're like, oh, really? What's the benefit? You know, trade off. You're in that kind of boring econ paradigm. But once you can genuinely say to them, hey, this is a no brainer, you can have it all. You can have cheaper, more secure, cleaner energy Then what's not to like. And I think we're just tipping into that um, phase now. And there's a beautiful phrase Simon uses in the book a couple of times, that we've been prisoners of the wrong dilemma. It's lovely. Mm -hmm. It's exactly right. And actually, the dilemma we have been in is, can we coordinate our expectations around this transition that is ultimately cheaper, 12 trillion perhaps cheaper, or rather than are we in this silly prison dilemma? And happily, I think we are now just beginning to coordinate on that right. I mean, even, I'm not gonna say the word equilibrium, on that right, you know, unstable attractor or something uh, that gets us into a, a cleaner economy. So thank you, Simon, thanks for the book. Um, thank you for everything you've done the last decade and thanks for continuing to provide us with hope. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron. And um, uh, just before we turn it over to you guys to we'll start thinking of your questions, I'll, I'll just add uh, a couple of two cents to, to, to build on that. Well, first, you know, as, as um, both Declan and Cameron were pointing out, being able to communicate these ideas in a clear and effective way is hugely important. I think you've made a major contribution with the book and also just the way you presented it here with the, you know, the lovely colorful graphics and so on. Um, you know, drawing together in a coherent way strands of thinking that have been bubbling around here and other places uh, in a way that your, you know, average politician on the street or, you know, voter reader um, can, uh, uh, you know, can grapple with is, is, a, is a real contribution. Um, I, I was reminded uh, when, when you were talking about the problem of framing, uh, one of our colleagues here, Miles Allen, uh, years ago, uh, gave a, a seminar and had some very technical title, but he cheekily subtitled it Will economists destroy the world? <laughs> and his point or his critique was he was talking about Nordhaus's you know, famous uh, optimal warming strategy, which you know, he's a climate physicist, was at utter odds with what the science was saying, you know, was sustainable with life continuing on, on Earth. And in some ways he wasn't exaggerating, but that framing, you know, this gets into the politics and diplomacy is not only wrong in a kind of scientific sense, it's not you know, the, the wrong dilemma, as, as you very nicely put it. 
but it's it's really um, been, I think, a huge factor in why the politics on this issue have been so difficult. Because when you think about it, um, framing it as a cost-benefit problem and, and starting from an optimal equilibrium where any change is going to have negative consequences has a huge status quo bias. You know, it immediately starts you with a status quo bias. And then you're quickly into the political fight of, well, you know, we can raise your energy costs to save the polar bears. And how much do you really care about the polar bears? Then that becomes our terms of, of, of debate. And, you know, for decades, we've seen uh, the losing side of that debate is the polar bears. Um, and, uh, you know, as soon as we can portray things as you know, near-term jobs and, and growth in the economy versus these long-term uncertain, you know, uh, risks out there, uh, we just, you know, we just can't win. And so transforming to this framing of transformation, which is both, I think, scientifically the right framing, but the politics of it are so, so much better. You're out of that zero sum mentality um, and into the, you know, um, how do we make the investments and, and coordinate to create this new and, and better uh, system that has upside for lots of people. And so in, in, in instead of our you know, old fights of who's gonna bear the cost, we start fighting about, hey, no, I want that wind farm in my state, you know, or I want the investment on the you know, uh, uh, EV charging infrastructure. And we've seen that huge shift in the politics happening in the US uh, around the IRA bill. And you know, I think the IRA bill has been misunderstood outside of the US, particularly in, in Brussels, you know, as a kind of protectionist you know, uh, state aid you know, beast. But instead, looked at through your lens, it's actually you know pushing us over the tipping point and creating a, a race to the top, uh, and hopefully a competition to make these investments and, and develop these technologies. And on the diplomacy side, uh, you're also absolutely right. I, uh, I I was very involved in the Copenhagen negotiations, working with the Danish government, and suffered through <laughs> through that trauma. And it was exactly as you described. It was the whole thing was a zero sum game. Um, uh, about who can bear the least burden. And, you know, diplomats are very, you know, if you tell a diplomat, you know, you're in a zero sum negotiation, they're like, yeah, I know how to play that and I will play it hard and well. And, and you have this just an incredibly skilled race to the bottom. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this, this framing, uh, again, you know, changes that dynamic uh, to hopefully a how do we work together uh, to make these investments at scale around the world and, and have the, the race to the top. So, you know, I think this frame shift that you very clearly articulate in, in the book, um, you know, is hugely important, again, not just academically, but um, uh, in these other realms as well. I've said enough. Um, let's turn to, I, maybe what I'll do is I'll take a, a couple of, maybe should I do it in groups of three to get as many people in, and then I'll come back to the, come back to the panel, starting with you, John. Yeah, the point about Bill Nordhaus, um, his Nobel Prize was celebrated by the fossil fuel lobbyists because they <laughs> said, here's the scientific backing for, you know, for this, this point of view. Um, the, the graphics were great. The, um, the, I think the second diagram on, on, the, on the, the global energy, sorry, the global climate system is the diagram I, I spent weeks looking for and, and never could find or design. Uh, and thirdly, on the building industry, it seems to me that, that housing uh, and buildings in general could be the most intractable part of, of, of the system. I'm wondering what insights you have on where, how the tipping point there could be could be designed and, and accelerated. Excellent. Thank you, John. So how do we get to the tipping point on the building environment? Yeah, uh, Simon, thanks very much. Um, that's fantastic. I, I obviously would like to spend more time on your Rubik's Cube at the end, but I'm just thinking if you were a decision maker in a developing country, and you're sitting on fossil fuel reserves and occasionally consultants come in and tell you you need to keep in the ground and you already see yourself lagging in the tech sectors um, with respect to the transition that's going on in in us and europe you can't afford an ira bill um it's not it is clearly is not just a zero-sum game it's, it's a negative sum game for you so how does sort of shifting to the short-term sectoral thing really shift the, the whole picture and how do we get a positive sum game for all the actors really building on the Great. Uh, yeah, thanks, Simon. Uh, really, really interesting. I wanted to ask you about the, the dynamics of ideas as somebody who work, has worked across science, economics, and, and, and diplomacy and um, economic economics. Why, why economics has been so slow? 
um, or what, why the change there has been, been so slow. We, we, we knew that the social cost of capital was highly uncertain 25 years ago, yeah, about 25 years ago. The idea of positive returns to scale isn't that new. Um, and yet, a, a transition to understanding complexity, which occurred in physics in the early years of the set, when we say occurred in the early years of the century, we mean the early years of the last century. Uh, and here we are in the early years of this century, and, and economics doesn't seem quite to have caught up. Can you explain why? <laughs> Excellent. So, uh, three great questions. Great question. I'll let each of you jump in. So, um, how do we get to the tipping point on buildings and, and the built environment? And, and there might be a broader question of, you know, where are the really hard tipping points to, to get to? Um, you know, developing countries who maybe depend on, on fossil fuels and, and don't have money for an IRA, and why are economists so slow? <laughs> Who wants to? Simon, do you want to? Kick us off. Yeah, how do we want to do this? Are we all going to have a question? Well, I, th I think you can each choose uh, anything you want to chime in on. Uh, you know. Yeah, sure. Um, well, maybe just to start with the last one. Um, I, I mean, I think you'd have a lot to say on this area, but I guess paradigms can be sticky things, and they may be especially sticky if a discipline has actually forgotten what the scientific method is. And I think economics has. Um, and, you know, when I see people like Paul Romer, former chief economist of the World Bank, calling his own discipline a pseudoscience, it makes me think I'm not the only one thinking there's a, there's a problem here. And the reason I say that is that there, there is this dialogue that takes place now and then between critics, critics of mainstream mechanisms and those who defend it. And it often has to do with assumptions, where the critics say the assumptions are all wrong, and the mainstream economists go, yeah, but that doesn't matter. And, you know, when, when the more you look into it, the more you realize that that is a discipline that has departed from the scientific method so long ago that it's forgotten what the scientific method is. And that makes it very hard to shift the paradigm. Um, I think there are also these aspects of system blocking, like, you know, why does Cameron have to publish in Nature instead of an economics journal when he's got a great paper? Mm -hmm. It's a, good, it's, it's a better journal. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Higher impact. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean, right? Um, the, the research gets funded by people who are stuck in the old paradigm. So we don't fund research on the new paradigm. Uh, how do we break that? I, I think it is. it may be strongly analogous to a technology transition that you need to invest in the push of the new ideas, which is like investing in INET, the R&D part, to come up with some new ideas. And you need to invest in the public, uh, use public procurement, just like we have in so many other transitions to create the first niche market for the new tools. And to be honest, governments on the whole are not ideological about their use of economic tools. They want some good ones, they want some ones that work. And so I, I think there's a big role in governments, but in, in other parts of the economy too, creating the initial demand. Now, any of you want to take on this very hard question of, if you're a developing country sitting on piles of oil, what's in it for you? Or if you're a developing country that doesn't have the money to do your own IRA, how do we how do we get this done? I'm happy to, but it's your your space. Uh, well, yeah. um, so that well, obviously this is a very very tough problem. And when I when I so I, I do a lot of presentations to um, officials in developing countries, and obviously it's, it's very different the questions between different countries. But but overall it's it's very difficult to um, convey because for them, in, in many countries, it's very difficult to convey where the positive is. Um, so, you know, you've got potentially huge transition risks and stranded assets coming, often from policies being um, implemented in the global north, which are then going to implement affect them. You know, we are asking them to, to keep fossil fuels in the ground when they have populations that desperately need schools and hospitals, etc. They're going to be facing significantly greater physical climate risks than we are. So it's a it's a very challenging narrative to to give. I, so I, I recently, for example, spoke to a central bank uh, in Africa who were asking me about the the C bands. We've talked about C bands before. So these are carbon the, border adjustment. And you look at the, the economic costs on, on countries in the developing world. So, you know, these are these are sensible mechanisms from the perspective of tackling global spillovers, et cetera, um, but actually have a huge cost. 
And I, so I can't give an easy answer, but one, one other thing I would say is that is we haven't talked about nature at all, but I think we need to, if we need to very, very quickly find ways to enable countries to get value from the natural capital that they have, because they need to be an really important part of the solution. Um, and the natural capital have is there is an incredibly valuable resource that we can bring to that. And you know, Cameron's written on this, others have written on this, the huge value. So I think that's one area that we need to advance significantly. And also to be able to paint a picture for this transition, how, how, what's their role in this transition? How can they benefit from it and make sure those mechanisms are in place? Obviously, then there's all of the additional, you know, the role of development finance, et cetera. I think mechanisms like the jet peas that are really positive in terms of bringing in investment. But fundamentally, we need to make sure that these markets that we're setting up are actually going to work for them so they get a benefit from this as well. You want to talk about, 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 about the hard to evade sectors? Uh, yeah, OK. I'd love to pick up on it all. But I mean, on, on buildings, um, I think the we, we have these these opportunities from time to time dare I call them sensitive intervention points, um, <laughs> which sometimes we just let go by. And we were just talking about one earlier, when you, know, you suddenly have a big increase in fuel costs. What's the logical response? I don't know. Why don't we subsidize fossil fuels for everybody so they can keep burning all of these fossil fuels and so the money can literally go out the leaky windows and up through the roofs? That's one approach. Or we could say, okay, well, let's let those higher prices roll through we collect more tax we then take that money we give it to uh, poor people in particular to insulate their roofs and to sort out their windows and to refurbish their houses and possibly lump some not you know lower the per unit price of the fossil fuel as well so which of those would you choose well, obviously the first one, and that's what we did. So we paid people to put their money out the windows and up through the ceilings. But so I think in more seriously, that there are there are moments in buildings where you just got to grab them. So new build, there's no excuse. There's absolutely no excuse for not having net zero new build because it is basically as cheap already now in, in terms of the capital expenditure. It's a bit more, but not much more. Over the lifetime of the building, you're saving vast amounts of money. It's a net, it's a net benefit. Um, for the refurb, okay, yes, it's more, much more difficult um, and supports needed. But again, um, these are there are moments when it's going to be cheaper. So forcing somebody to take a perfectly functioning <coughs> boiler, rip it out, and stick in a heat pump, not a good idea. But if you are redoing your roof anyway, because you've got some broken tiles, then think it, you know, I mean, you know the story, so it's intervening at the right time. Can I just say something about econ? <laughs> as, as the guy with the go ahead on the, <laughs> on the panel. Um, and as, as you guys know, I can be as critical as anybody, and I was banned from asking questions uh, during, my, during my postgraduate studies. It was so annoying. Um, so on Nordhaus, it's an embarrassment, honestly, because uh, I have to de defend Nordhaus. Is it okay? Like, you know, what is he doing? What is he thinking? I don't know what he's thinking to get optimal warming of four degrees. But what I can say is that the model, while structurally not something that anybody at INET would like or approve of, the, the structure of the model isn't awful. You put some sensible assumptions in there, you get warming of between one and a half and two degrees. So as much of the problem with Nordhaus is the assumptions he's making and the science he's using as it is with the deductive logic of the particular Dice and Rice model. There are better models, but it's not a horrible model. So uh, it takes us to what's wrong with the economics or why it's so slow. I think part of it is that um, it's been rigorous in a mathematical deductive way. So provided if then works out, then you're doing good economics. If the ifs are totally dodgy, what ifs? You know, it, because the, the, the process that we're analyzing is, is the box of deduction. And to give an example, there was a paper in the American Economic Review not, not that long ago that kind of caught the eye of some of us that I had offered. 
um, saying that because there's so much physical inertia in the climate system, we didn't really need to do anything about climate now for several decades, and the social cost of carbon is very low. And we're reading this paper and thinking, what? But there isn't that much physical inertia in the climate system. And we checked the physics, and the physics was wrong, and wrote to the editors, and you know, the story was well. The response was well. There's nothing wrong with the economics, so it's not our it's not our, it's not our problem if the physics is wrong. And those of us at INET were like, well, hang on. I mean, you've got this is the leading allegedly leading econ journal saying that we don't need to do anything about just, it. Just to be clear, it wasn't the physicists is wrong; it's the economics interpretation sure, of the, the physicists. physicists. Yeah, exactly. No, but, yeah, the, the physicists need their stuff. <laughs> not always, but on this occasion, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I think, and that goes together with this fact that economics is the discipline that cites the least other disciplines of all disciplines, which is quite a striking. So the, there are some of the problems. That said, just to go briefly in defense, um, not much of a defense, but still, if, if you take modern methods of um, causal economics, there's some really good stuff being done there. Right, really rigorous, annoyingly rigorous in some instances. Absolutely, making sure that you've got your data sets right, and you, you've, you know, you can claim causality. You're not just finding correlations, etc. It does sometimes lead to us doing the whole. My key is I'm looking for them under the lamppost because that's where the light is, rather than work on the important problems because the level of rigor required leads you to certain particular data sets. But, but it's good rigorous stuff. I think the other thing to say is that a lot of these ideas are in economics and have been in economics, sometimes for hundreds of years, other times for decades, like path dependence, not a new idea in econ. Increasing returns to scale, not a new idea. Non-convexities, not a new idea. Most of this stuff is in the literature, theoretical and empirical. The problem somehow is that those ideas don't seem to then bubble up into some kind of coherent worldview that incorporates them. They're still seen as being tweaks or anomalies or modifications to the standard theory, not actually the standard theory. That's my sense. So I wouldn't write off all economics nor all economists because there's a lot of good stuff in there. I feel like when, I, when I'm in an INO audience, I have to say that. <laughs> uh, but that's not to say that all is well either. Thanks. Excellent. Well, we've got time for one more very quick round of questions uh, before we break for tea and biscuits. Uh, yeah. Um, I, so I guess my question basically in terms of the um, like targeted investment thing and the idea of neutrality or abandoning neutrality, what happens if we invest in the wrong things? And I say that as somebody who spent a year kind of managing a project on fuel cell car deployment, which is a year that I'll never get back. <laughs> I mean, our government's always in the best place to decide which technologies to favor. Um, and I guess it kind of speaks a little bit to Eric's question of, uh, you know, what are the more difficult tipping points to, to get towards and kind of how do we address that? Mm -hmm. Excellent, great question. Uh, in the back. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, as someone doing my PhD on climate change communication, thank you, Simon, for making me uh, at least understand most of it. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to pick up on this point about communication. So. I mean, all of you have brought this up. So are we really talking about communicating to governments or are we also talking about public engagement to help them understand these ideas? Excellent. Um, any more? Last question? Sure, comment. Yes, if, if, if Ben Franti were here, he would have answered um, the part of the economics problem is, is funding by the fossil fuel industry, which has had a huge influence on American universities and think tanks. So that negative, uh, influences corrupted economics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, great. Um, so, uh, good question about, you know, can this abandoning, you know, maybe we agree neutrality was never really real, but how do we actually avoid picking users and what do we think about picking winners? And then, uh, great question on, you know, how do we up our communications game? Mm -hmm. Who do we would like to jump in. So I, I, I'll say something about um, the technology question because I think Cameron, you, you had a comment on that, which I very much agreed with as, as well. And it, it is one that often comes up. And I, I think it's important not to be sort of dogmatic one way or the other. Um, I think there are, as you said, there are situations where we don't know. Uh, like, for example, a couple of weeks ago, 
I met the guy who leads UK government policy on decarbonizing aviation. And uh, I don't know if I really ought to be saying this on a film that's been recorded, but anyway, he said, we don't know. We actually don't know which one the solution is going to be. And I think that's true in several other sectors too. Mm -hmm. So when you have that situation and you know that you don't know, then you can design competitions. You can do demonstration projects of lots of different things and set out your criteria on, what, on what's successful. You know, all sorts of ways of designing competitions. And I completely agree that, that you should do that. So I think that's particularly important where you're at that early stage of the transition. I think as you go through the transition, things change. The, the, the good solutions become more clear and the failing solutions become more clear, like, like it now is in road transport. Right? We can all see it's battery electric, you know, at least for light road transport, it's not. Fuel cells is not biofuels. We know that now, and it's definitely not hybrids. Sorry to add. To um, and so it's it's more at that stage, once, once you actually have some good knowledge to go on, and it just is expert judgment, then it should be quite clear, actually. Any given policy will advantage some things and not others. And if we have a zero emission vehicle mandate, supposedly a technology neutral policy, it will advantage battery electric cars much more than it advantages hydrogen fuel cell electric cars because we have an infrastructure of electricity in this country and we don't have a hydrogen pipeline infrastructure in this country. So they're not starting from the same place. So it's, it looks, we think it's technology neutral. It's not, it's advantage in one or the other. We have to consider it consciously, think, is that what we want or is that what we don't want? The only way we can do that is expert judgment. And if the experts get it wrong, we get it wrong. Any thoughts from, from you guys? Well, maybe I'll say something about the communication, but also just on that point, I, I would say, if we were not getting it wrong somewhere, then we're probably doing it something wrong because we don't know how to solve this problem. So it's, yeah. it's of course, we're we going have to, to try. We have to try and we yeah. will fail somewhere. Yeah. But if, if you're not failing, then you're not trying. True. Um, so, so I think I remember writing a business, I used to work in government, writing a business case where I actually explicitly said, we expect um, at least 50% of these projects to fail. And I remember the, 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 the team that I was working with that were going to implement this, like, wow, that's amazing. The UK government is giving us permission to fail. And then the minister announcing this and the, and the comms department of this particular department say, we cannot <laughs> say this in public. <laughs> Keep that below the, below the radar. <laughs> but I think we, it is, um, we, we have to expect to fail. I think on the communication side, so, so this, is, this is such an important one. I, I don't think we don't do anywhere near enough on communicating to the public. And that's so important because so I've, I've often, I've worked in many different areas in my career and, and I've always been trying to think, what, what are the areas that actually has the levers that you can pull that actually make a difference? And one of the biggest ones, if, if the public does not understand what we're doing, we're not going to be able to, to do this. And I, and, um, and I, I think there's, there's a lot of big challenges there, like how you, how you communicate risk without scaring people and, you know how how I think this positive view of a transformation is is a really good one, and linking it to things like being able to say how this is going to help you with energy security, etc. Obviously, is really important. But the, but the really other point I want to make is the the need for greater transparency with the public about what is actually going on, um, and you know looking looking at uh, you know, the situation in the UK at the moment. There's so little transparency to the public about, you know, these policies are being made. These are going to have this impact. This is what different actors are actually doing. So I, I really believe in the importance of more disclosure, clear metrics, actually measuring what's happening, more, more enabling the public to see what's happening, but also enabling then experts to be able to see what's happening. Because some, sometimes that data isn't even available to the experts that so we can be analysing through the so I think more disclosure of information is a really important part of that. So quickly add on that comms point. Um, clearly, the answer is both. You have to communicate differently um, to the public on a mass scale versus a decision maker, a government person. The reason it's both is because um, the public or publics, as we call them, are decision making all the time. They're making their own decisions about what to buy and how to invest and who to vote for. Uh, but also what the public is reading and knowing and thinking, you know, our political leaders, you can critique them as much as you like and you can and you probably should, 
but they're they're fairly well tuned in to what the public know, believe, want, etc. That's how they get elected. That's how they stay elected. So changing public views also changes the Overton window, the space for maneuverability at the elite level. That's not to say that there aren't occasions where there is a sensitive intervention point at that elite level that doesn't necessarily require public awareness or buy-in or conscious, you know, 50 plus percent approval. I'm not saying you ride roughshod over the public, um, but sometimes, you know, there is this thing called leadership where you do the right thing and then you let people know why. And then gradually after a while, they come to say, okay, actually, you know, they were right. And approval follows the action rather than leads the action. And I still, you know, I feel fear we don't have enough of that leadership um, these days. So that means that it's not just about doing the public. It is also about talking to the elites and saying, you know, this is your moment. This is your chance, your opportunity, maybe even your obligation to lead. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, well, uh, just to close us out, I'll, I'll just maybe finish by you know, saying one of the most important messages of your book and, and the framing it provides is that this is an evolutionary and adaptive system. And, you know, we know in such systems that uh, they aren't necessarily efficient. We do have losers, failed experiments, um, but they are effective. And at the end of the day, solving the climate problem is about effectiveness. You know, whether we save the planet, we'd like to save it you know, more efficiently than less, sure. But the main thing is that we save it, that we are effective in, in decarbonizing and, and, and meeting other ecological limits. And one of the things that gives me optimism is, you know, we've seen in Simon's book talks about it, when we change the fitness function through you know, regulatory pressures, through creating incentives and, and investments, the system responds. And you know we've seen this unleashing of um, you know innovation both on big scales and on smaller scales uh, across the system. And I keep coming back to the thought: the reason why we haven't made as much progress on this problem is because we just haven't tried yet. And we're now trying. And we're seeing that you know as the cumulative engineering hours and smart people's hours and, and creativity gets unleashed on this problem, that we you know we can actually hopefully go five times faster. So uh, thank you to Simon. Thank you to our brilliant panelists. And there's uh, tea and biscuits uh, just outside to continue the conversation. Thank you very much.